What's up, everybody? Here we are again. Full Auto Friday number 124. Away we go. Okay, got the red smoke. Gun run! North and south! West of the smoke! West of the smoke! Okay, copy. West of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, what a minute. Give it to me. I need it. Get cleared hot. Can't be cleared hot. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Time for some Friday Q&A. I have found a new way to make sure that I keep this as concise as possible. Slightly accidental. Um, my only parking spot today is 30 minutes or less. So let's get into this because I really hate the ticketing guy here in Kalispell. He loves his little fucking chalk wand and he'll write a ticket like a son of a bitch. So away we go. The reason I'm writing to you is because I live with what I could, what I would call dream crushers. My mom, grandma, and aunt are all judgmental, and it doesn't matter what it is, I'm judged on it. It has made it that I can't tell them anything personal with confidence that I'll be supported on, and with that, I keep a lot of secrets from them. For example, they have no clue about the six-month depression I went through a few years back where I had the thought of taking my own life which only my best friend and hunting partner know about and help me get through it. It has also led me to become what some people would say unmotivated on things because of the thinking, it's not worth it because I'll be judged anyways. It has also created a fuck you attitude, not just towards them, but also towards a lot of people if I'm doubted or told I can't do something. It feels like I have something to prove and prove them wrong. Any advice on how I could deal with this would be great. If you don't read this, it's not a big deal. I just needed to get this off my chest. Um, you know what? I don't actually think that this is that uncommon. And I'll start with it sucks that those who are the closest to you biologically, your mom and grandma and aunt, are the ones who are being the most judgmental. Uh, my perspective on family has much less to do with the genetic ties and much more to do with how people treat you and how they care for you and whether or not they're actually there for you in the moments that you need them. So although these people may fall in your family tree, some along the trunk and some along the branches, it may be better for you to limit your interaction and engagement with them. Because what you can't control is your mom or your grandma or your aunt. The only thing that you have control over is yourself. And feeling like you're being judged all the time, in my experience at least, uh, it's difficult because I don't know about anybody else out there listening to this or watching this, but I spend enough time judging myself as it is. Um, and I actually struggle with and consistently work on negative self-talk and being able to catch that early on in the cycle and change that and change the language that I use with myself because it's incredibly important and it definitely informs the outcome on the things that you're trying to accomplish and just how I feel as a person. Um, so if I have that power in the way that I speak to myself, I don't want to give that much power or credence to others having that impact on me, especially if they are part of my family, but they're not really treating me like that. So your best friend and your hunting partner, what I will say is that it's awesome that they knew about the six month struggle that you were having with depression and the thoughts that you were having. And I think it's an amazing thing that they were able to help you through that. That to me sounds a lot more like family than your mom, grandma, and aunt. And maybe they're great people and this is just a shortcoming in their character. Or maybe they're fucking cucks and you need to uh, go ahead and shave off some of those branches of the family tree or be like a little flying squirrel and jump over to another one. Um, if you're around people that are very judgmental and you feel like they're always going to come at you with uh, a negative viewpoint, you'll never be able to do that. You think you're going to be judged anyway. Don't tell them shit. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. Uh, I've talked about this a lot on the podcast, circle of influence and circle of concern. Circle of concern are things that you worry about. Circle of influence are things that you actually have control over. And if you do this exercise and you lay these two circles out, one of them, like I'm holding up a coaster right now, that could be your inner circle of influence. And you'd have a massive circle on the outside of that, some uh, similar to an archery target, I suppose, but only with two rings. And the inner ring is circle of influence, the outer ring of circle of concern. What you're going to find is 
circle of concern is going to encapsulate things like your mom and your grandma and anybody else you may meet in your life and the things that they say and their judgment and what they think of you. And you can be concerned about that, but you need to recognize you have no control over that. Then you go into the circle of influence, things you can actually control, how you think about yourself, how you talk to yourself, the relationships that you actually spend your time, energy, and effort developing with your hunting partner and your best friend. Those are things you can influence. Focus on that small circle. And what I'm about to say is incredibly easy to say and very difficult to do. Cut away everything that is in the circle of concern or do your very uh, best to spend the least amount of time on it as possible. Um, I think it's okay to feel like you have something to prove, um, to feel like internally to yourself that you feel like you can do more and maybe you question whether or not you're going to be able to achieve your goals. I think if you're wondering whether or not you can achieve your goal, whether it's even possible for you, I believe that you have you have landed on a very inspirational and aspirational goal. If you know for a fact you're going to be able to do it, it's too much of a low-hanging fruit. You need to go higher up into the tree. But constantly, you know, feeling like you have something to prove and you need to prove everybody wrong, I'm not so sure that is necessarily healthy. I'd have certain goals in your life that I would allocate that energy for, but I can't imagine walking around every single day feeling like that in every aspect of your life. And I'm not saying that that's the case for you, but I would, I would avoid it at all costs. So it's created a fuck you attitude, not just towards them, but also towards a lot of people. If I'm doubted or I told I can't do something, you know, people will doubt you and they will tell you that things uh, are not possible for you to do. And what I'll say is you have a choice in how you receive that information, right? You can't control what they say, but you can control how you receive it and how you frame it. Negative reinforcement for some people is a great motivation. For me, it's always been like putting a log onto a fire, but that's not the case for everybody. And maybe that's not the case for you. But when people say those things to you, you have the choice in how you receive it. You can receive it as an insult or you could receive it as a motivational log that you can then throw on the fire. Um, and I don't know where you land on that, but just think about you know how you view the feedback that you might get from people and how you can frame it to yourself and talk to yourself about it. And don't make it really a uh, an issue of trying to prove it to them or prove somebody else wrong. Prove it to yourself because everybody has ups and downs, the sine waves of good days and bad. And on those bad days where you don't really want to do what you know you need to do to achieve this lofty goal, you throw that log on the fire and it burns really fucking really hot and really bright and it lights the way for the path and you can stay on it. And if you can stay on that path, people will scratch their head and wonder how you're able to do the things that you're able to do. And maybe your mom and grandma and your aunt, you know, maybe they'll... Maybe they'll change their tune a little bit, or maybe they can just fuck right off into the sunset and you can find a more supporting group of people that treat you more like family than your current family is. Question two, I'm almost finished with the hiring process to become a special agent with the Drug Enforcement Administration. Well, I actually thought it was agency, DEA. I'll be 24 in November, have a master's degree, and I'm ready to get after it. I began training in Brazilian jiu-jitsu a little over a year ago, and I'm currently a four-stripe white belt. I don't train for a belt. That comment was to show you that I'm taking my training seriously. I work out multiple times per day, and I'm committed and excited about a career in law enforcement. At the same time, I'm very close to finishing up the hiring process with the FBI for a supportive slash surveillance position, in parentheses, non-law enforcement role. And I'm weighing the pros and cons of the DEA position and the FBI position. So one of my questions would be, do you have any advice for young people when making important decisions about their future? Secondly, I find myself looking for validation from people in the law enforcement community when discussing my per, uh, prospective DEA or FBI employment opportunities. These are people I trust with this information, so that's not the problem. I just feel like I want to be accepted. But I guess that feeling might only happen when I'm actually in that community. Anyway, my second question is, have you ever found yourself seeking validation from others? And if so, how did you handle it? This isn't something that happens all of the time, but I do find myself feeling this way from time to time. Just to reiterate, law enforcement is a passion of mine, and I'm doing this because I want to and believe I was born to do this. My father was a police officer, and I've always felt a calling for this profession, which I think is awesome. I know that the law enforcement profession right now, depending on who you talk to, is under an interesting optic or lens. Uh, the societal view of law enforcement shifts over time. Um, 
let's just say it's probably not the best environment for it. And I'm glad to hear that there are still people out there who feel like it's a calling um, and you're drawn to the profession. Those are the type of people that I want to enter into the world of law enforcement. Um, awesome job on picking up jujitsu. Everybody's been a four-stripe white belt at some point in time. Enjoy the ride. It's a marathon, not a sprint. That's the best advice that I can give you. On to your questions. Do you have any advice for young people when making important decisions about their future? The best piece of advice I would give you, and the, the question that I hate, you're 24, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably for a minute here talk about, I would say for people younger than you, maybe in their high school years or even before. The question that I hate that is posed to young people very often is what do you want to do for a living? What do you want to be? And I remember being asked that question, and I was lucky that I had an answer when I was, when I was young, but it ties into the advice that I would give you. Take your time. For people who are young and who are trying to figure out what they want to do with their life, don't rush. That would be my biggest piece of advice. You're 24. You're working your way through college. You've already have your master's degree. So you've had some time to get some laps around the sun, some experience under your belt, probably have a better understanding of who you are and what it is that you want to do. And I would say that because of the path that you're on and how you wrote the email. Pretty clear that you are sure of yourself and the direction that you want to take. When I was 18, if I hadn't found being a SEAL, I wouldn't have been sure of myself. I would not have been tooled well to go to college absent supervision. Um, it would have been an app, it would have been a train wreck and I would have failed. And I think a lot of people are pushed to try to define what it is they're going to do with the rest of their life at an age where they don't have the answer to those questions. And I think that is okay. So take your time. And when you're making important decisions about your future, if you're looking at different options and things that you want to explore, my best piece of advice is find somebody who has gone down that path and have meaningful conversations with them. Pick their brain, but in an insightful way and in, in, in a way that has a design to it. You know, don't waste your time or theirs, but think about these people. Reach out to them. The internet is a beautiful thing for exactly this, where you can connect with people. But ask meaningful and intentful questions that you have about that path and then do something with that information. Either make a decision to follow down that path or move on to the next. Uh, second question, have I ever found myself seeking validation from others? And if so, how did you handle this? Yes, I have absolutely found myself in this situation. Um, and I don't think that this is uncommon at all. As a human being, being as a species, I personally think that we do better in groups. And what's the one thing that you want to have if you're around a group of people? You want to be accepted and you want to be validated. You want to be accepted as a meaningful portion of that group. Um, when I first began the SEAL pipeline, I, you know, as a bud student, I looked at the instructors who were wearing the green shorts and the blue shirts, and they were my absolute heroes. And the only thing that I wanted was to make it through SEAL training, make it to a seam, uh, a seam, to a SEAL team, and be accepted by my peers. I wanted to be recognized as, I guess it would be one of their equals, but at least as one of their peers. And I wanted to be accepted as somebody in that tribe who belonged. Um, and that happens, I think, every time that you change jobs, every time that you, you know, the selection process has continued for me inside of the military. And every time you go somewhere new and you make it through a selection process, you are, of course, going to be seeking validation from the people that you end up working with. How did I handle it? Um, probably not well at times. I definitely have had issues with my mouth throughout the course of my life. Uh, people who have known me the longest probably would let you know that I'm a touch of a smart ass. And I, and I, personally feel like oftentimes I default to that because uh, it's a defense mechanism. I'm actually, at the end of the day, a pretty sensitive person. And it allows you to deflect and defend yourself a little bit. Um, but it's not, it's not a great long-term strategy for success. The best one when it comes to seeking validation is to let your actions speak louder than your words. If you are you know, the law enforcement career path that you're talking about, you need to make it through the academy and you're going to land at your first job, whatever that may be, do the absolute best that you can at that job and try to be a value add to the people that are around you. If you do that, there's no need to seek validation because your efforts will be validated and you will be accepted inside of that community. 
So this has happened to me often, and the best way that you can do is just work your ass off. Put your nose to the grindstone and let those actions speak louder than any words. And do the best that you can to use less words and more actions. It's totally common to feel that way from time to time. Like I said, we're a group species, in my opinion at least. I'm not an anthropologist by any stretch of the imagination, but that's where I land on that, and that's the advice I have for you. Question three, I'm writing to get your thoughts on the recent rise of the internet star Andrew Tate, as I am seeking guidance on how to speak to my friend who has become a devoted follower. As you may know, Tate has risen to prominence in the last few months from producing shocking and controversial content and opinions. I know he talks a bunch... Uh, I know he talks about a bunch of different topics, a lot of which contain sexist and misogynist views. As a father of two girls, the majority of what he says boils my blood. I know most people say, if you don't like him, then just don't listen. However, I disagree with this. I think it is important to hear out the person's view to gain stronger understanding. So after listening to a number of his raw, uncut interviews, I can honestly say the guy is a total asshat who is performing and saying controversial things to get views, followers, and money. However, I go back and forth on him being deplatformed from all social media. On one hand, I think he is messaging to younger people. On one hand, I think his messaging to younger people is dangerous. But at the same time, I do support freedom of speech and self-expression. I just don't know where I land on this. Now, since Andrew Tate's rise, a friend of mine has become obsessed. He only refers to him as the ultimate G, which is apparently Tate's nickname. He also constantly talks about him and his teaching. He quotes him all the time during conversations and is now starting to verbalize anti-female sentiments. I've literally lost count of how many Tate clips he has sent me in any given day. And overall, my friend sounds like he's joined a massive cult. As much as I love my friend, a lot of this makes sense, as he is the stereotype of the kind of person who would potentially be gravitated towards Tate. My friend is a bit of an odd one within our friend group. He's a complete couch potato. He's impossible to motivate and spends most of his free time on his phone on social media. To make, things, uh, to make things worse, my friend feels very disenfranchised by society and blames everyone for his shortcomings or makes excuses instead of taking extreme ownership. What are your thoughts on Tate? And what would you say to a friend who you fear is going down a bad path of influence, especially when there are so many more positive motivational speakers out there like Jocko and Rogan that he is aware of? Any thoughts would be extremely appreciated. Whew, uh, big one. Uh, not a big one, a lot to unpack. I don't know a whole lot about Andrew Tate. I am aware of who he is. Um, mostly because I have come across some of the the clips that you are talking about. And I think he did a pretty good job of describing how I feel about him. Um, he is – how did you describe it? Let me find it here. Uh, the sexist and misogynistic views. I've certainly um, heard some clips of his where they they land in that category. And this is your words. I can honestly say that the guy is a total asshat who is performing and saying controversial things to get views, followers, and money. From what I have seen, and I, and I don't know this guy at all, uh, from what I have seen, that's his business model. He is doing, I would say, exactly that. He is trying to be controversial. He's trying to be a provocateur at some times. Why? Because the clips that he creates can become very viral so they can get views, which can increase followers, which could increase monetary income. Um, I have no idea about the guy's financial liquidity. Maybe he's extremely wealthy. Maybe he's pretending. I don't know, and I don't fucking care. Um, but I do think what he is doing is calculated, and it is around the views, followers, and money. And if you can recognize that, I think it removes a lot of the power of the potential, in air quotes, messaging or message that he is trying to uh, put across. You use the word teachings in here somewhere, and I in here right here. He also constantly talks about him and his teachings. Tate's not teaching anybody anything. He is... A persona and he's playing a persona like I said for views followers and money if you're into that type of thing be into that type of thing um, I would advise people against it um, with the way you described your friend you know the person who could be gravitated towards Tate uh, an odd one within the friend group kind of a couch potato impossible to motivate disenfranchised by society blames everybody for his shortcomings and makes excuses instead of taking ownership what you're describing is the exact type of person, in my experience, who gravitates towards this person. Because this person and the character that they are playing is everything that this couch potato fuck actually wants to be. Because he's a beta. And Tate is presenting himself as an alpha. Is Tate actually an alpha? No fucking clue. Don't know anything about the guy. But the audience that he is going to have the most gravity towards is your buddy. 
Um, and that says a lot more about your buddy than it says Tate, because if there wasn't a Tate, there would be a Frank. And if there wasn't a Frank, there would be a Jeff or, you know, fill in the blank on and on and on and on. There's going to be somebody who fills that void, who is saying the things that make sense to your buddy, because your buddy, instead of actually looking in the fucking mirror and making life changes, would rather be able to point the finger at everybody else and everything else in the world, as opposed to taking that ownership that you had talked about. So it makes perfect sense to me and it is no surprise that people like Mr. Tate um, have the following that they do. Um, what would you say to a, f- a friend who you fear is going down a, a bad path of influence? Very direct conversation. Be like, hey man, just so you know, I've actually seen a really drastic change in behavior from you and it's not awesome. I don't like what I'm seeing and I actually don't want to have anything to do with you if you can't change your behavior. And I would explain exactly where you think it's coming from. You know, if you think it's truly the uh, Tate that is changing your friend's opinion, it's changing his vernacular and his thoughts on the world, I would bring it up directly. And I would also, from the perspective of being a father of two, you know, talk to him about how the way that Tate describes certain things and how that resonates with you as a father of two girls. Um, Those are important things, especially if your friend is starting to change his vernacular and using that type of language. First off, keep him the fuck away from your kids and maybe keep him the fuck out of your life if that's the path that he's going to go down. It's going to have to be his choice at the end of the day. All you can do is be honest with him and the changes that you are seeing. Um, And, you know, you're talking about whether or not somebody like that should be deplatformed. I am not a fan of censorship at all. I can't think of a time in history or a situation where censorship was the answer or it had a positive outcome. I do believe in an economy of ideas. um, And unfortunately, some people have ideas uh, that suck and they can get really popular on uh, social media platforms. But I do believe that over time, people are able to separate the wheat from the chaff. Um, Now, there are people like your friend who are probably going to be like a tractor beam sucked into this person. And there might be some people who start off uh, with some level of interest, but over time in this economy of ideas where instead of hiding things in the shadows, everything is pulled into the light, good ideas separate themselves really rapidly from bad ideas. And from what I have seen, I'm not an expert at this by any stretch, but just anecdotally from what I have seen in my own life, people like Tate who play a character, if you give them enough time, that that character plays itself out. And people will lose their tolerance for it. The more you hide it, though, the more you try to push people away from being able to speak uh, in the in the public square that social media portrays itself to be. I think oftentimes you can actually drive more attention to them. Um, it sucks. I don't like a lot of the things that he says. I don't necessarily appreciate the character that he plays. But it is who he is, and it's what he wants to do with his life. And I think that people need to be able to separate and take the time with that information and that character and make the decisions on their own. Um, I don't think deplatforming, <sighs> I don't think it's the right call because again, it's a form of censorship. Um, I also don't think it's a really good idea to promote him and ideas like that. I mean, maybe everything should be promoted equally. Of course, that's a fucking pie in the sky idea, which is impossible, especially when social media platforms are driven around monopolizing our attention span and time, we are literally the product. Our attention is literally the product at this time. So things that are viral get more promotion. It's, it's. I think the internet could be a great thing. I don't know where social media platforms fit into that and the health and wellness associated with that. Um, and unfortunately, it seems like people uh, who make content like this can be put into the forefront because of the viral nature and the algorithms associated with that. But again, back to the first question, circle of influence, circle of concern. Do you have control over how much time you spend on social media? Yeah, you certainly do. Do you have control of the amount of time you spend with uh, beta cucks who are looking at somebody like Tate and putting him on a pedestal and basically trying to become a, a, a version of them themselves? Yeah, you absolutely do. You can control all of those things. And if that's the way that that guy wants to go and that's the person that he wants to be, then again, find a sunset and he can fuck right off into it. And that's all I have on that one. Last question. I want to become more proficient in shooting, specifically pistols, in the event I need to protect myself or my family. My current knowledge of shooting is very basic. So to get to the point, here are a couple of starter questions that I have. My dad was a police officer, and he liked to carry a forty-five, and his reasoning was stopping power. I agree with this idea 
because I don't want to be in a shooting match with someone. I want the subject stopped immediately. I want to get your take on the caliber of round you would suggest for concealed carry. So I'm going to answer these as we go here. Stopping power. I'm going to call stopping power a misconception. And maybe maybe that's a sloppy word for it. Perhaps it's underdefined. First off, before we even get into caliber, caliber, caliber. Wow, that's an interesting word. Caliber. What I'm going to say is this. In my opinion, and when I start, when I answer this question, I hope everybody understands that I am speaking from a perspective of my opinion and my opinion only with my experience uh, and my experience only. I am not an expert in ballistics. I'm not an expert in firearms, any of those things. Just my personal uh, opinion on this. Accuracy is final. Accuracy is far more important than the caliber of round that you have in the weapon that you're going to use for self-defense. Specifically, I'm just going to talk pistols uh, for the rest of this question because that's what it was framed around. So long before you get to caliber, you need to focus on your accuracy. Now, can caliber have an impact on accuracy? Yes, it can. Um, go out there and shoot a snub nose 357 Magnum and stand the fuck by for icing your wrists. Or even a 45 is going to have a drastic recoil in comparison to a 9mm or a 38. Um, are any of those better or worse? I'm not going to judge them uh, along those characteristics. What I'll say is the experience in handling that firearm and managing the recoil is very different. So first, make sure you're actually accurate with whatever platform um, you are going to be shooting with. Because I'm going to guess... Um, and I don't see this say this negatively at all. I'm gonna guess and I'm gonna hope that even though your dad carried a 45, he actually never shot anybody with the 45. And the reason that I said that stopping power is not I forget the word that I use, false or a misnomer, is that it's not actually about the caliber of round that you're using, it's about the accuracy of the round and where you can place it on the human body. Uh, a 45 is not gonna just drop somebody as if their spine had been pulled out of their body. Um, in the movies, is it like that? Yeah, it really is. And people go flying backwards and it's just boom, lights out. Now, don't get me wrong. If you put a 45 right above the bridge of their nose and the vast majority of their brain matter exits the back of their head, yeah, the lights are going to go out. Um, do a little bit of data, though, on actual hit rate when it comes to officer-involved shooting, the number of rounds versus the number of rounds that struck in a kill zone on a target, and you are going to be fucking shocked. Again, with the hit rate as low as it is, I don't care if you're using a 45, a 9 millimeter, a 22, or a paperclip gun. Accuracy is what is actually final. So stopping power, I would, thinking through this in real time, stopping power to me is a combination of the caliber and type of bullet or projectile that you are using and your ability to accurately place that in a, a strike zone or a hit zone that is going to have the intended effect. 45 caliber round is going to hit hard. So is a nine millimeter round. You know, are we talking about a 45 caliber ball ammunition or a nine millimeter hollow point? They might hit, you know, again, you'd have to get down to the foot pounds and all of that stuff, but the relative damage that they could do could almost be the same. But if you shoot somebody in the forearm with a 45, there's no stopping power. If you shoot somebody in the face with a 9 millimeter directly above the bridge of the nose, the stopping power is going to be instantaneous unless it deflects off of the skull, which is possible depending on the angle that you're shooting at. So, caliber of round for concealed carry. I don't care. People ask me these questions all the time. I'm not dogmatic when it comes to the caliber of round. You need to select a caliber of round that you can control and put rounds on target. Now, nobody wants to be in a shooting match with somebody, especially if that other person can shoot more accurately than you, because I don't care what gun you have. If you can't shoot accurately and get rounds on target where you intend them to go, and the other person can, you are proper fucked in a gunfight. So I would start with what can you shoot the most accurately with? Can you shoot a 45 accurately? Certainly you can. Um, most gunfights are not ended with one round. You're probably going to have to, at some point, present the weapon, line up your sights, and engage. 
And again, my personal opinion, once you start engaging, you engage the threat until the threat doesn't exist anymore. You are driving the threat to the ground from a standing position, seated position, whatever it is, you drive the threat to the ground and you continue engaging the threat until it's not a threat anymore. That might be one round. That might be your entire magazine. So, you know, and you know, when it comes to that, let's look at carrying capacity of most magazines for a 45 caliber round versus something like a nine mil. My personal carry is a nine millimeter. Um, and that's probably because I have a lot of experience with a nine millimeter and I have the ability um, to easily source um, nine millimeter. I've trained with it. I've used it. I've carried it for decades. Um, and so this brings up another point as well. When it comes to Let's just say you've decided on a caliber. I'm going to go with nine millimeter because you asked me about myself. You have some additional questions that you need to ask yourself. What type of nine millimeter round should I use? Um, and holy shit, I can barely keep up with uh, advancements in ammunition at some point in time. Uh, and I've never actually really cared that much about it. So I will, I'll talk about some broad options and then talk about what it is that I have recently switched to and what I'm really liking right now. Um, there's ball ammunition, which will probably – it will not designed necessarily to mushroom. And when we talk about mushrooming, what we're starting to talk about here is is the ability to create tissue damage or destroy whatever it is that the round is impacting. There's ammo that's not designed to mushroom at all. Uh, and a lot of target-based ammunition is exactly like that. I think it's probably cheaper to produce. And you get on – I mean, you're going to shoot paper on the range. You don't need anything to mushroom. Uh, then you have hollow point rounds. Um, and people are probably very familiar with these things. And what people may not be familiar with is that hollow point rounds have limitations, you know, against human flesh when they do function properly and they mushroom the way that they, they should, they, they can create a large amount of damage, but how do they perform if you have to go through a windshield? How do they perform if they hit something, um, before, uh, your intended target? And there's also, you know, you need to think about what if when you're shooting at something, you have to be aware of your backdrop as well. So let's say you're in a home defense situation and you're using ball ammo, which is not what I recommend by any stretch. And you shoot somebody and you zip them up through like maybe the rib cage and it doesn't actually hit any rib, exits the backside and then hits the drywall behind the person. There's a potential that could go a couple walls deep. Um, there's also potential it could hit a stud in the wall and stop right there. Um, but that's one of the characteristics of, you know, uh, standard ball ammunition is that ability to penetrate through things like that. Hollow point may not go as far. And then recently, um, a company called G9 Defense actually reached out to me and sent me some of their ammo. Um, and I, from a technical perspective, it's, I am not going to be able to describe it, but the ammunition itself is based around maximum damage slash tissue destruction and Overall, what would be the best word to describe it? It is designed around when it hits flesh to do as much damage as possible. Working on the concept of, you know, fluid is not compressible. Again, I can actually, uh, maybe on a, a future episode, what I will do is dive in deeper once I do a little bit more research. But essentially, the reason that I was interested in it is that for me, what I am looking for is something that if need be can penetrate through glass because I've had to shoot people through glass before and it really sucks when the round loses 90% of its effectiveness once it hits that glass. I need something that has the ability to penetrate and in my own personal opinion, why do I carry every day? Why do I carry a pistol on me every day? It is so I can protect myself and I can protect others. That pistol is not coming out of the holster unless I am intending on using it. And if I intend on using it, I want the round that is the most lethal as possible. And in messing around with these G9 defense pistol rounds, they are fucking savage. Um, and I recommend people check them out. But if you have other ammunition that you are training with, or you have the ability to do so, pick up a 15 round box of a variety of different types of ammo. And I would recommend things like going out, if you have access to it, shoot ballistic gel, um, if you don't have access to that, maybe go shoot some fruit. If you don't have access to that, maybe go shoot some jugs of water. And what you're going to find is that rounds have a really different um, characteristic when they hit those different mediums. If it is your intent to defend yourself and to defend others and you need to use a firearm, 
probably the best thing that you can do is be carrying the most lethal round possible. So enough on Amy on that. I want to begin some classes. What would you What would you suggest a class progression look like? Again, I have very best uh, basic shooting techniques, self taught, so there are likely flaws. Um, well, there's always going to be flaws because nothing is perfect and nothing is is complete. Uh, if you have very basic shooting technique, I'm going to assume that that means something on a static range where you're used to putting a pistol down in a range setting and you're always loading it uh, in the same manner and you're shooting in a very uh, narrow shooting lane. And maybe I would just add to that, maybe go to an outdoor range or find somebody where they're going to let you shoot steel or a facility. Um, and if we're talking about everyday carry, EDC or concealed carry, uh, the biggest piece of advice I have is start practicing your draw cycle, side alignment, and then firing the shot from a concealed uh, carry situation. A lot of ranges will not allow you uh, to go and come um, draw from a concealed holster, and that's for safety. Um, side note on safety, next time you go to a gun range, do me a favor, everybody who's ever been to a gun range, what I want you to do is stand in your lane, look down range at the target. It's probably gonna be a 25 or a 50 yard target range. And then what I want you to do is to look directly up from where you are in your shooting position and then start looking at the ceiling, working your way down towards the tail end of the range. And then stand by to be shocked at how many bullet holes you see in the ceiling that are either directly above you or at like an 89 degree angle. And then they continue to pepper the ceiling all the way down the range. That's where rules like this come from. And I can kind of understand it. There's a story behind every one of those bullets in the ceiling. I'll just leave it at that. So a lot of ranges are not super savvy with having people drawing from a concealed holster. Uh, maybe find a range that you can uh, or go to an outdoor range. And I would recommend, uh, you know, standing. Yeah, that's great. But what if you need to draw from a seated position? Uh, and you can get as far down the rabbit hole with this as you want to. You know, what if you need to draw and you have your seatbelt on? Do you clear your seatbelt first or do you access your tool first? What's the procedure that you're going to do? Do you exit the vehicle first? Do you shoot through the glass? These are all things that you can work your way to. But I would just start layering in a little bit um, more complexity as opposed to a static range. I would look for a range that allows you to train in a little bit more of a dynamic environment. And seated position, I mean, you can honestly just pull out like a – I wouldn't do like a folding lawn chair, but you could bring out a plastic – chair um, and just sit on it. And it's you'll be surprised in how it changes things from your draw stroke to clearing fabric out of the way to access your holster. You know, the seatbelt is in fact another thing that can add some complexity. It's not hard at all if you've practiced it, but if you've never practiced it, it could be a problem. Um, and what should you look for in a shooting training company? Um, I would look for somebody that is well-reviewed. I mean, the internet is an amazing thing. Spend some time on it. Read the reviews. Um, and you don't have to look for somebody who has like a fucking special operations military background. There's plenty of very high level uh, shooters and instructors who have never served a day in law enforcement and they've never served a day in the military. And that's totally fine unless they are trying to teach you how to be in law enforcement or shoot like law enforcement or shoot like the military. Because if they haven't done those things, you know, it's not their wheelhouse. So I'd be cautious of that. But really take your time to research things that may be in your area because it's not going to be cheap, but you're also going to be allocating your your time as well. Um, go and talk to the instructors, get an idea of their background and let them know what it is that you are looking for and let them answer the question as to whether or not that is something that they have to offer. And that's it. I'm going to get out of here before I get a parking ticket. See you guys on Monday.